Hi, uh, my name is Amy Castanel. Uh, I'm uh, on the national digital team at the Working Families Party, um, and I'm joined by my colleague, Brittany Whaley, who's a senior political advisor. Brittany, did I get your name right? <laughs> I mean, your title right, at the Working Families Party. Um, and we are convening a panel this morning um, with three women who've uh, run for office uh, to talk about their experience of running for office, why they did it, um, what challenges they faced, and um, you know, give some tips for folks who may be thinking about running for office or really just want to demystify um, the process of modern elections. Um, so we're joined today by um, Janice Lewis George from DC, Tiffany Caban from Queens, and Kendra Brooks from Philadelphia. Um, Brittany, do you want to say a few words before we um, bring on the panelists? Can you see me and hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, welcome. I just want to say welcome. This is really exciting to have this conversation with women of color who are progressive, who have been bold in their, in their policy platforms and in the way they run their campaigns, and really just shed some light for other women and, and folks who want to, you know, run for office but don't know where to start. Like, this is, this is why we're here and why we wanted to create this space. So thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll just give you a, each a few minutes to, um, to tell the people who you are because y'all are amazing and more people should know who you are. <laughs> so uh, we'll start with you, Janice. Can you introduce yourself and, and mention the office that you ran for? Yes, um, good morning, everyone. I am so happy to be here um, on this panel with so many dynamic uh, women. Um, Kendra Brooks and Tiffany both inspired me to run. Um, and so I just recently ran uh, for council for Ward 4 in DC. Um, taking out a two-time incumbent back by the current mayor. Um, I previously am an attorney, um, an activist, um, working here in the District of Columbia. Um, and so I'm excited to be on this panel today and talk with you about my primary win um, and what we're doing right now to secure a win um, in November. All right, thank you so much. Kendra, can you introduce yourself to these fine folks? Sure. Uh, my name is Kendra Brooks. I'm a city council person for the city of Philadelphia. I am the first Working Families Party candidate to win an election in Pennsylvania. So it's really exciting. Um, I have been inspired as well by many of the women on this call um, just stepping out and running as a progressive woman um, in this in this atmosphere that we're in. It's one thing to be a progressive. This is another thing to be a progressive woman of color. That's a, a whole nother subject, right? I see everyone <laughs> shaking their heads so they understand. So I am always inspired um, when we get to connect and have these conversations and encourage um, the next group of pro progressive women of color, especially black women, to stand up and take control. And Tiffany, can you? Yes, absolutely. Um, first of all, it is just such a complete honor and privilege to be sharing in space with y'all. Y'all are, are folks that are modeling incredible, incredible things um, in this moment, so I appreciate you. Uh, I'm Tiffany Caban, and I am from Queens, New York. I'm currently a, a national political or organizer with the Working Families Party, and I do political strategy as well. Uh, but before that, I was a public defender who ran on a radical leftist decarceral platform um, for district attorney here in, in Queens, we came very, 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 very close to winning. But the, the beautiful thing I think that came out of that um, is that we are building uh, that particular electoral strategy and movement around the country. So I think it's also an important message to say that like so many of us run in this space and some of us get through and like, you know, make it. Um, but it, in so many ways, when you lose, you win because the work is continuing, we're building it and we're creating more pathways for other women and especially other women of color to do the same thing. So thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for being here. I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, part, part of the thing that makes it hard for women of color to run at all is because you don't see what it looks like. And so our hope here with this panel is just to give people like a window in so they can see like what worked, what didn't, uh, you know, what it felt like for real humans. <laughs> <laughs> Brittany, do you want to um, start off or do you want me to? Yeah, 
You're muted, homegirl. <laughs> Yeah, I can jump in with the first question. So I think, actually, I think y'all spoke a little bit to the first question as you were <laughs> introducing yourself. So we always hear about this push, especially in politics, um, towards gender parity, right? Um, and a lot of times that conversation is just not nuanced. And so when we're talking about uh, getting more women elected, when we're talking about women of color, and then you add the progressive layer, and then you add um, you know, being a woman of color or holding other identities that have been oppressed, whether, you know, you're queer, your abilities, or just a whole slew of things, right? So living at the in all of these intersections, I, I wonder if y'all can speak to, a lot of folks are sitting and they're, they're on the sidelines in some ways, but they're very active in their communities, right? And so I'm wondering if, because the work didn't start you know, when you ran for office, like you could speak a little bit to what that process actually looked like, right? So if it takes a woman seven, I think they say it takes seven times of asking a woman before, like we run for office, I actually have not, touched, you know, I don't know, um, but you <laughs> have to multiple times, right? So I'm, I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit to, you know, how you, how you came to that decision to put your name on the ballot, right? To put yourself like front and center and for, for all of you on this call come from kind of behind the scenes work in the community um, to being front and center and like representing so many women and so many people. I, I can go first. I think for me, most of it was fear. You know, I come from, um, I, I live in the heart of Philly, North Philly at that. You know, I'm a single mom. I have four kids. Um, I've never been married. Um, my children's father has been incarcerated, like all of these things that put you further and further away from the front lines. But I've also always been a fighter for my community, actively involved in my, my children's school, first as a typical home and school mom, and then realizing that, wait a minute, this is crazy. You know, they want us to bring coffee and donuts, but don't want us to make any decisions on a budget or policing, right? So once I began to flip the script, it just opened my eyes to layers of systemic oppression that we see not only in education, but our environment in my neighborhood, um, the criminal justice system, uh, law enforcement, like all of these things. I felt like I was like awakened, like I stepped out of this bubble. Um, so when people began to ask me to run, all the things I listed in the beginning were the reason I said no. You know, the fear of judgment, to the fear of exposure, and the crazy thing, it wasn't exposure of the people who I have organized with on the front line because my story resonated so well with so many of the people that were willing to come out. It was exposure from the people who said I couldn't do it. Right. Exposure from the folks that said, there's no way we be a single woman from North Philly that was currently on public assistance, right? Could even do this. But that's the story they wanted to put in the forefront. They didn't forget the fact that I worked my way as a single mother with four kids and I have an MBA in management and I was downsized after working a job for 17 years that I built and I had to break down, which can you imagine creating a program for 17 years and then had to dismantle it in 90 days. At the same time, my kid's school was threatened um, for closure after I had left my job and I had, was losing my home all in the same 90 days, right? I realized if I can overcome that, I can do anything. And that that part of my story needed to be told, as well as the fact that I work my way through college and I have an MBA in management, and that women who have my similar stories or a piece of my stories could change the narrative and win and really change what government looks like and really fight for working people. And, you know, what made me say yes was that. When I realized one of the things when I do a lot of speeches now, I could tell everyone that everything, you have everything that you need and you are enough. Because all of the things that made me who I am are the things that people make me feel that that wasn't enough. You know, I had to do, have this perfect life because that's what we're taught as women, that you have to be perfect. Um, and I realized it was perfections in my imperfections. And that's what made um, this, my fight towards, you know, running for office compelling to folks that usually don't get involved in politics. 
Yeah, I, I will say, um, and, I, and I resonate with so much of what Kendra said, um, I ended up running, it, it became a series of me getting really frustrated um, over a number of years, and my frustration really propelled me to run. Um, frustration with the leaders around me, I felt like I kept talking and sharing my experience and experience of others, and they weren't listening. Um, and so for me, it started back, you know, in, in 2016 with our current council um, and, the, and the incumbent I ran against. Um, you know, I had to take off work. I was a first year attorney and my dad got sick and I ended up having to take, um, I looked, took all my vacation leave to care for him. I took all of my sick leave and I ended up having to take unpaid leave um, to care for my father. And, um, you know, I ended up having to quit my job because they just didn't respect as no matter how much I had worked hard before, I, I, I knew what I was doing. I was a good, I was a good worker. They didn't even respect that during that time. And so, um, you know, my father unfortunately ended up passing away and I really wasn't, you know, um, you know, I became at that point just angry at the fact that that's the case for so many, having to care for your children, having to care for your spouses, having to care for your parents and deserving a living wage while doing so. Um, and so in the fall of 2016, we were voting on paid family leave in the city. Um, and it was really like three months after my father had passed away. And so obviously I went to go testify, I went to go talk to my current council member. And it was like I was talking to a wall. He was just like, businesses are going to be hurt by this. Um, I'm not doing it. And so, you know, he ended up, our, the incumbent ended up voting against paid family leave. And so I was, I was pissed. Uh, and then 2017, we had this thing called, you know, how TOPA rights, which are Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act rights um, here in the district. Um, and DC, as you know, has gone through gentrification like no other. You know, we had 22,000 residents displaced um, faster than anyone, uh, any other uh, city. Um, and all of those 22,000 residents, 98% were black and brown families, and they were families I knew. Um, and so I actually was able to, um, the house that I grew up in, we ended up losing that home. When I came back home, my mom, you know, who's a postal worker, she's been a postal worker for 30 years, even with a good union job, wasn't able for us to stay in that house any longer. Um, and I ended up taking on a job as a waitress, taking on a job as a sales clerk at Nordstrom, doing Howard Law School at the same time. Um, and so years later, I was able to use TOPA rights when the owner of our house was like, hey, I'm selling, you guys got to go. I was like, I'm buying. And that's why I exercised my TOPA rights. And literally, Six months after I did that, used those rights, the current council member co-introduced the bill to take away TOEFL rights um, from single family renters. And so when that bill came up, um, I was heated. I was like, listen, you can't do this. Families have already been displaced. If you take away these rights, more families will be displaced. And no matter what I said, they still ended up voting, taking away those rights, rights we've had since the 1970s. Um, and they voted against it. So I was just like heated. Um, and then 2018 came and we had uh, Initiative 77, which was one fair wage for TIP workers. Um, and I had worked as a TIP worker throughout all of my time in law school. So I knew that $3.89 wasn't enough to support families. Um, and I knew how much women were impacted by that. Um, and so we ended up doing it as a ballot initiative. We voted for it as a ward, we voted for it as a city. Um, and then right after we voted for it, the you know, restaurant lobby came and lobbied our council members and they overturned our vote. And so what we had just voted on, literally the will of the people were disrespected. So for me, I went from pissed in 2016 to you know, angry, you know, from angry in 2016 to pissed in 2017 to running for office in 2019, because I was tired of giving my voice, giving my all, organizing people to try to get them to change their minds. And then I realized, you know what? You know what? They're not changing their minds. So we're gonna have to change the people who make the policies. And so I stood up and said, I'm stepping out um, and I'm tired. And so that's where kind of my, my path went. You know, it's nothing like you know, a, a black woman who's on a mission and who is angry um, to stand up against the people. And so that's, that's kind of how I, I moved in, in, into this space. Um, and, and that's kind of where my journey took me. <laughs> Thank you. Tiffany, you want to chime in? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think this is something that all of the, the folks on, on uh, this call can, can identify with. But like, you know, I started my professional career as a public defender and I like eat, sleep, breathe my work as unhealthy as, as that might be. And operating within a system where you just feel like you are screaming 
into a void, right? And um, you know, you you lose more than you win. Uh, and the, the moment that I that we were in when I decided to run um, back in 2018, 2019. Uh, was like the 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 first going into the second cycle of this like quote unquote progressive prosecutor movement and the language was out there the playbook was out there uh, we had you know I I practiced in Manhattan New York and we have a district attorney that was was touting the playbook saying the good things getting the press around it um, and then I was consistent like we were in the court the very next day understanding that our clients are black brown poor immigrant queer clients um, were consistently the exception to the rule, no matter what. Um, and I, it, it took a lot of reconciling, again, as a public defender to say, do I really want to step on the other side of this aisle to, to be a prosecutor? Because, um, and to like make no mistake, it was, it was coming to the very real understanding that this was harm reduction, that it was a strategy that was necessary um, in the space to be present with a whole bunch of other strategies if we were going to have any chance at uh, you know dismantling our, our system of, of mass incarceration and, and mass criminalization and um my my home girl the, the brilliant amazing alana Sivan, she's a good friend of mine um that was a former public defender works at city council now as, as counsel um of the, like the, their criminal justice um section but she kept asking me to run and then two more of our friends were were, were asking me to do it. And, and i'm gonna be honest i I didn't feel like I could do it. I knew that there were things that I wanted to do and that I wanted to say. I didn't think I had a shot at winning and I wanted to do it just to hold people's feet to the fire, call them out on their bullshit and really uplift the stories of my, of my clients and also my, like, my, my family and my friends, right? Like what brings you to that kind of work, I think are your personal experiences. And so the communities that I serve or the communities that I grew up with that come from that are directly impacted. Um, but real talk, like I almost didn't do it because of my background, right? Because I didn't have a safety net. You know, I went to, my, my mother didn't graduate high school. My, my father um, graduated high school and like the game changer for our family was that he got a union gig after high school. Like that changed everything. Literally in my mind, I'm like, that is what separates me from my client on any given day. The things that uh, being part of a union family afforded me in terms of uh, a semblance of stability around housing, healthcare and education. So I was the first person in my family to like complete an undergraduate degree and, and uh, go on to law school. At, but I was also like the first person in my family to take on that crazy amount of debt. And it's this re really difficult cycle where you don't make any money as a public defender, but I have six figures in student loan debt. And then I'm, I'm in the public interest student loan forgiveness uh, program, which is a 10 year program. You're paying based on your income, which is very low. Um, and like se I was seven years in, three years away from having it forgiven not only not having ever touched the principle of my loans, but having the, the interest, just keep racking up and just keep telling myself it's going to be okay because this is my life's work. And in year 10, it'll be forgiven. And how hard it was to walk away. I like, I get emotional even thinking about it because I still feel sort of like strapped down um, by it. Um, but like how hard it was to walk away from that. H having internalized the experiences of growing up, you know, my family, my parents grew up in public housing. My grandmother was there until the day she passed away. And like watching her um, as somebody who, you know, would, would borrow 20 bucks, 50 bucks a week from my mom or my dad to make sure she was putting food on the, on the table um, for herself and, and uh, my aunt and uncle who were around my age. She was a, a foster, um, a foster parent who adopted a couple of kids. Uh, and um, like just having this, this fear of not being able to to live with any sort of dignity or or pay to, to meet my basic needs and so walking away with that also was like there was emotional trauma tied to that and i was really scared to do it um and then giving up health care you know like to to run like these are all really scary bar barriers that we shouldn't be asking as to whether or not we want to serve our communities especially when our experiences and our voices are, are really important um in this space but ultimately at the end of the day and i think folks touched on this I had just really, really incredible, powerful women around me, supporting me, telling me that they got me. And because we were doing it that way, when we stepped out and were in the public, um, our community rallied behind us too. And so it was, it was a beautiful thing that I am very, very grateful and thankful for, but it's also a really, really difficult thing to come to.
Oh my God. <laughs> I'm like crying. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for sharing those like very, I think, relatable stories about what drove you to run for office. But I'm going to ask you a question that's a little bit less um, emotional and more uh, like nuts and boltsy. Because a lot of people, um, you know, will ask you say like, oh, you should run for office, you should do this thing. Um, and people come to me all the time and they talk about how hard it is to find information about all of the things you need to do to run, like the administrative things, like knowing how to file, opening a bank account, selecting a treasurer, building a website. How did y'all uh, navigate all those things to learn like what to do and what not to do and put it all together? Because that is not easy to find. I know from personal experience, because I considered running for an office this year in Georgia and I could not figure it out. <laughs> it was the most stressful um situation you know once once i decided we started i started to put together a kitchen cabinet um of people who you know people who wanted me to run who were excited for me to run and you know what when the people who ask you to run you you put them to work automatically you want me to run help me find a treasurer you want me to run help me find a campaign manager like you want me to run i need this um and so i started to, you know you gotta those people who you begged you to run you gotta start like putting them to work automatically i was like why well, do you on my cabinet um and then you know this that summer i ended up going to the black campaign school um, that Collective Pack had done, and Jessica Bird, thank God, it was the first time I had met Jessica, um, and I, you know, pulled to, I know every attendee wanted to talk to her, and I just pulled her to the side, and I was like, I'm about to run, and I don't know what I'm doing, and da da da, and she was like, you know, Jessica just has this way of just like calming you, and being like, we're gonna do this, um, and she helped me, I was like, I need a campaign manager, and she had known some, you know, black campaign managers, um in the past and so she connected me with michelle whitaker who ended up being my campaign manager um uh, i had talked to you know i was like okay well i need a campaign treasurer um and we started to go through the rolodex of people in the district who you know had done some work before and that's how i ended up getting um latifah Lyles as my campaign you know as my treasurer and like i ended up getting black women campaign manager black women treasurer which is also like if you want a person of color as your leadership you also are just like whoo it is very hard to find, okay? And I think we need to do more work as a movement of, of putting together campaign operatives who are people of color um, because it's, it's just really hard to, to find. Um, but, and then they kind of helped me navigate through it. Um, and we all kind of like navigated through it together. And it was, you know, the first campaign finance report, we were, we, all of us did not sleep and we were up all day for like 12 hours to enter the stuff in. Um, by the time the third time cycle came around, we, we finally got it. But at first it was like the most stressful um, experience and, and, and it was really hard for us to navigate. So, you know, I would just say everyone who, you know, uh, who, who you talk to, who wants you to run. Um, and then, you know, we had, you know, I, I was working families party, um, DSA folk, um, I, you know, people who have been operatives in campaigns before, I called them and I'm like, I need your help. If you want me to, if you want me to run, I need you. And so that's really kind of how it happened. But believe me, it was like, it was like crying. It was tears all the way through. <laughs> I'll go next. All that Janice just said, and the fact that I was running as a third party candidate, the fact that I had no party support on either side, that mean operatives in general did not want to touch my campaign, period. Like no one wants any part of that. Um, and I wanted, to, as well as black operatives, because they're put in a situation where there's not that many of them, number one. And it's so easy to get, no pun intended, blacklisted, you know, within party politics. So I understood that no people were hands off, willing to offer information behind the scenes, but definitely not going to be in a photo shoot, right? definitely not going to be the first one on the line to give out the information. So one of the benefits, since I ran as a third party candidate, I didn't have to primary. I had a couple of friends that had already primary. Um, and one of my good friends was kicked off the ballot because of campaign filings. So we learned actually from her mistakes. So everything that we thought was going to happen to get me kicked off the ballot, 
we uh, memorialized the event. We had our attorneys, we had it on the news, how we turned in the ballots, that they were accepted, that we asked the question, went to each room. So it was a strictly political public stance that we were taking because the fear that I was gonna be put off the ballot or all my uh, signatures were gonna be challenged. And we did that because, like I said, this was the first time doing a third party. And really when we went down to the, to the city hall, we got a lot of roadblocks. Like, People didn't know, weren't sure. You start calling other folks, they weren't really sure how to do it. So I think that, um, like Janice said, Working Families Party stepped up and helped us all the way around the same play as DSA folks were involved. And the point that I definitely want to reel in is like, we need to take this time to make sure that we're creating more operatives of color. Trying to find operatives of color was like a needle in the haystack. Um, I love my team. My campaign manager actually was my colleague. We were organizers together. Um, so I, when they said I was going to run, I said, you're going to be my campaign manager. She was like, I don't know anything about being a campaign manager. I said, well, I don't know anything about being a candidate, but we're going to figure it out together because we're going to be like this. I got a whole lot of business that I, need, I don't feel like bringing somebody up to speed on my craziness, right? Keep in mind, I'm a mother of four. I'm the matriarch of my family. Like, really, like, you got to know all my business. I need for you. You already know half of it. Let's just sit down and have a chat. Um, and then as we started navigating, trying to find other operatives, it was a needle in a haystack trying to find operatives of color. And I think um, the left has to do a better job of building our own political operatives. And I think um, prior to this particular year or two in politics, we haven't. So hopefully, you know, folks that are interested in politics, even if you don't want to be on the front line, we need folks behind the scenes making all of this happen. And this is the time for you to get involved because we need more of us inside. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to keep it super short because y'all uh, hit so much of it. Um, so many growing pains, first of all, but I, I think a big piece of it too is like just being committed to, to demystifying some of it. Right? There is so much bureaucracy or, or the ways that it's given to us or told to us. It's like, well, you can't do this unless you have been here doing this for a certain amount of time or, or whatever it is. Like now in August of 2020, I can talk to you about universes and wind numbers and, you know, all the different infrastructure and apparatus. I didn't know any of that. Like I didn't have language for that. I didn't know what it was supposed to look like. But what I found to be really successful is again, coming together and being like, we can and we will do this. And um, what we did was uh, anybody who stepped up for a position, um, we said, okay, what do you need to feel supported in that role? And so then they would have their own support team, essentially being like, if there's stuff that you can't figure out, there would be two or three people that were also volunteering be like, well, we're going to help you figure this, this thing out. And so they were like these mini, you know, support networks within support networks. And we found that to be um, really helpful because all of this stuff, is doable. There is no part of a campaign that any one of us that has been doing work in our community cannot do, cannot own, and cannot lead it. Period. We have those skills. Um, and so I think a lot of it is just getting over the idea that like it's foreign and, and we we can't do it. And then taking advantage of, um, you know, Kendra, what you said of like there are folks that for a lot of different reasons, um, like wouldn't work with us, wouldn't, but but we're like, well, we'll help you behind the scenes. We'll take advantage of that too. You want to train my, my folks up, like help them get to where they need to be, create some pathways so that, you know, like other folks don't have to be in, in that position and we start breaking away from it. I just, I just want to add one thing. There's so many, um, uh, we, as we know, I'd be really honest, there's so many comrades uh, who are white um, and so many people, you know, they're on the left who are white from, you know, and so, um, one of the things is if you're a true ally, if you're a true comrade, it means teaching and making space for people of color operatives. And I will, I do appreciate, you know, some of the comrades who said, Denise, I could be your campaign manager, but I'm, I'm this, you know, I'm this old white guy and I shouldn't be. So I will help your um, campaign manager. I, sh I could be your treasurer, but I, I'm, I, I shouldn't be because I'm this, you know, young white dude who comes from a family of privilege, so I will help them. And so one thing we have to put out in the space is if you're a real ally, if you're a true comrade, it means making space and teaching people of color to be operatives in campaigns.
I was just sitting here trying to pull out all the nuggets <laughs> uh, that we just covered. But for folks who are who are listening, if, if you're taking notes, you heard kitchen cabinet, get your squad, right? Make sure you got people who you can trust, but also activate those people and put them to work. Um, the training. So I heard collective pack that they were um, lifted up. Um, I know they did several trainings last year. But I tell people all the time, whether it's Emily's List, Working Families Party, Collective Pack, Higher Heights, if they are doing a training <laughs> and they are providing information, you need to go and get that information, get skilled up. And honestly, you're growing your network. That's where you'll find a campaign manager. That's where you'll find those other candidates who are roughing it out, right? Um, and then I heard DSA, WFP, find those organizations that throw down with you on the ground. Uh, sometimes we're embedded in campaigns, sometimes we do our own thing, but we work and we move on the ground to move people. Um, and then I heard a call to white folks, like make space, right? And so if you are an ally, you're a comrade, you've had access, you've been in certain rooms, some people of color have not, and we do need to diversify the folks who are working behind the scenes. And so Janice, I appreciate you uh, for lifting that up. I want to do just like a rapid fire, like if we could do a few questions and like, you know, whatever comes to mind, I want, I want you to throw it at us. It won't be anything too, you know, off the rails. Um, <laughs> so the first question is, what's one thing you wish you would have known as a candidate that you can share with others here? I'm going to say real quick two things Bye. I wish I would have known. Um, I wish I had a real conception of how how big a borough was like running a <laughs> borough wide two and a half million person race because <laughs> like you throw it but it, there's just no way to conceptualize it when you start um but the other thing i i think i wish i would have known um there's no way to to really fully understand um the toll it takes emotionally and mentally um from your body i think you know there it is an experience that is one of the most beautiful, powerful, impactful things that I have ever um, had the privilege of, of being a part of. Uh, but at the same time, after my race, there was a lot of healing to be done. And that's real too. And so thinking ahead of time and, and managing to find ways to maybe engage in a little bit more self and community care, because um, it it's a really difficult thing to do. I think mine is on care too. I wish I would have prepared myself physically for a citywide race. I, yeah, I just wasn't 12 hours a day or more seven days a week for months. Um, I'm, I might look a little young, but my oldest daughter is 30. Um, <laughs> So it was, it was a lot of mental and physical strain on myself and also my family. I think sometimes, you know, we, even though I have a strong safety net or support system, I do feel that the time that was taken away from my children all that time, I mean, during the campaign, um, I'm still feeling it like we're on vacation now. Um, and this is what vacation looks like on the other side, right? So, you know, it's the reality. You have to make sure you prepare yourself and your family. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go across the same lines. I wish I would have had a self-care plan and some level of, of therapy support, trauma support during the campaign, which um, Makia from Working Families Party ended up being like my counselor and my organizer at the same time, okay? Makia was the one like speaking life into me and I could have that. Um, so I got to give it up to Makia for that. But um i wish i would have had a self-care plan because my i i totally got out of whack and once that was the case like i stopped running i stopped wa walking i was uber eating every day and it was a thing and i wish i would have prepared my family more um my mom um was a post is a postal worker in in our community 
Um, and so they tried to get my mom fired from the post office. Now, mind you, my mother has been working at the post office for 33 years and she's coming on retirement. Um, and you know, there are federal Hatch Act laws that, you know, apply to postal workers. And so, you know, people would come in the post office trying to talk to my mother in the newspaper. I talked about her being there and they would be like, oh, and vote for your daughter, da, da, da. And you know, that could get in trouble. And so my mom would be like, oh, I can't talk about it. Um, they end up filing a grievance and somebody had to come watch my mom you know, the postal service had to come watch my mom do her job for two weeks. And my mom's been standing on her feet every day for 33 years to give my, me and my brothers a better life. And that one hurt me the most because this is the woman who sacrificed everything for me. And I just couldn't believe that they would come and attack her, especially when she's coming up from retirement. Her pension is on the line. Her livelihood is on the line. And they took it so personal to come after my mom in that way. And I felt it. But my mom, you know, she's a strong woman of faith. She was like, daughter, don't you worry about it. I don't want you to stress about it. No weapon formed against us, your proper prosper. You know, she real black mom, you know what I'm saying? She was like, no weapon, you know? And so while they were observing her, she said, they can come observe people for three weeks. I don't care. Um, but for me, that's when I wanted to go into like all defense mode because you came from my mother. Um, and so I wish that, you know, I had prepared my family better um, for the attacks that were going to come their way. Can I have one really, really quick thing? Also, um, I learned because it took me too long because we give and we give um, to readily accept. I had a really hard time when people would offer to provide additional support to me. Um, whether it was like bringing meals to my home or like all these little things. Like I had so much, like I was like, but you're already given so much in X, Y, and Z way. People will help because they want to help and trust in that and let them help. Let them help. Yes. <laughs> uh, I do have, I want to know, um, are there, um, in the same vein as Brittany's rapid fire, uh, can y'all describe like one, ongoing sacrifice that you've had to make as candidates as elected officials and as like political operatives like what what's something that has carried on like that you still have to deal with everything um finances right um like like you said you know i still have student loans i gotta pay navient i gotta pay fed loan and, and they, there's some chunk payments there you know and um, there's a financial sacrifice there that is, is very real um, in running. The other thing is I am married. Um, and actually, when I ran, um, it was like I had just I had just got married. And then three months, two months later, our first year of marriage was me running for office. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, first year of marriage was was running for camp was running for office. And, um, you know, so our my you know my marriage we we had to work out and, and i'm happy to have a, a supportive you know spouse but that was that was hard and it's a sacrifice and just like kendra says she's on vacation even um when i was on vacation you know when i took off after the campaign i had to do like campaign debriefs we got endorsed by 33 groups and each of those groups wanted to do a separate thank you and debrief and so you know every vacation is like a vacation with an asterisk um, on the side where I'll call into at least two calls or three calls during that vacation. And so that's something that also just like, you know, really never ends. And also just going to the grocery store. Like if, if, if I get caught at the grocery store, which I do, it is an hour long. I was on the aisle looking for just some onion soup dip mix. And I ended up in an hour and a half long conversation. Okay. Um, and that was crazy. So, you know, when you go out and about, you just got to realize like at any moment you could be, you know, pulled into a conversation. You got to learn to set boundaries in a nice way, being like, hey, listen, I'm, I'm at the grocery store. I just, I did it up. But learning, learning that balance is really hard, especially if you have a heart of service, which most women of color do. So, yeah. I think I echo, echo Denise's same thing to the point that I live, I live, like I said, in North Philadelphia. I don't know if you guys, you know, we live in row homes and I live in a neighborhood that my grandma also lived in. So when I say I grew up in this neighborhood, so to the point that I couldn't even sit, like sitting on the porch is like work. So we created a backyard paradise, but that does not stop my neighbors from hollering over the gate if they need me to do something. But it, you know, I've always been that person, but when it expands to like this grocery store or, um, when I'm at my kids back to school nights, like 
everything becomes work. Even out to dinner, we go out to dinner and I sign the paper and my name and they was like, I think that's, you know, so it's always working. Um, it, it, it doesn't stop. It's still seven days a week. You're never off. Um, and I think I said the biggest sacrifice is trying to create that balance um, and understanding and still be the best mom I can be because I still have a 12 year old and a 16 year old. And my 16 year old is walking in my footsteps. So now she's stepping into activism. So she also has calls to get on. So we've gotten to the point that we're on calls together. So she sits next to me and I'm here and we're doing this together. But um, still helping her set boundaries in her beginning, in the beginning of her, you know, activism career. So, yeah. So I, I think I'm going to talk about this from a little bit of a, a different perspective, right? Because, you know, we, we fell short, right? I, I didn't win the, the race for DA. And so the work that has continued after that is actually taking a lot of time, especially after seeing what we built out, the coalition that we built, um, to say, I didn't win that seat, but I ran for a very specific reason. How do I, con now, how do I continue that work outside of this role? Because again, there is there are always multiple strategies um, to to try to get what we want to get done, and so a difficult thing even to this day post race, uh, which is also a, an absolute privilege, right? Like these are good problems to have, um, was just continuing to be in relationship and conversation with these stakeholders and feeling a lot of push and pull about like what work would look like now for me. Um, I found my home with the Working Families Party, which I like just am so, so gr grateful for and, and love um, and continue to organize in my community uh, around different issues. But, um, you know, when you I think that when you step into this space and when you do it for the reasons that we do it, you no matter the outcome, you don't step away from it and you try to take advantage of it and build on it. Um, so I so some of what you talk about resonates in in, in terms of um, some of the privacy that you you give up um, when you have a platform uh, some of the conversations you have in the street and and sometimes it feels like there are less opportunities to have like real unguarded um, downtime uh, but uh, I don't know at the same time it is it's it is totally a blessing I am I am thankful to be um, able to, to to do the work that I'm doing but it does feel like a, around the clock work so yeah. like the balance is important I want to add something to Tiffany's thought because I ran as a pair. It was myself and Nicholas O'Rourke. And I think I won, but he also won. Like, I think one of our conversations throughout the campaign, I was like, no matter what, we both could end up with a job after this, right? We're going to figure this, this out, right? With each other. And I think um, when it came down for jobs, he too is with the Working Families Party. And I was more excited to know that he has my back than being on my team. And I think that's how it works. So like when I'm in these places and people always asking questions, how can they get involved? What can we do? I'd be like, ah, oh, call Nick. And it's really good to have that direct because we like we had two campaign managers, ran one campaign, but we were closely connected through this whole time. And I, I wish he was with me on this side, but I'm really happy to have him continue the work on the outside for us to continue to build this movement. So to Tiffany's point, I, you know, I feel like I, 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 we were broken during a campaign once at the end of the election and he didn't win, but we're still together because he has that, all the work that Tiffany's doing and I'm doing the work on the inside and he's doing the work on the outside. And I think that was important. And I didn't want to not recognize him in this place because we ran together. Shout out to Nick for sure. It's a privilege to get to work with that man. So Nick, had, he had a little fan club, you know. But no, he, he's doing great work though, and Tiffany's doing good work. work too. I mean, I I appreciate that. Like we can work alongside y'all too because you're bringing a different perspective, right? So you have run, and you you've heard all the issues on the ground, and the work didn't start when you ran for office, right? And it didn't stop. So it's it's like we were able to um to bring you home in a different kind of way. Okay. <laughs> um, so one, I, I'm gonna ask one last question and Amy, I'll defer to you on timing because I know we had like some, I think some questions maybe, 
But um, we, I just want to end on like a high note, right? Like we talk a lot about the challenges. We talk a lot about the 12 hour days, a lot about the sacrifices. So I'm wondering if each person can share, you know, what was something that was very rewarding during the campaign that kind of got you through, right? As you, you dealt with a changing life and, you know, being a, a full-time candidate. I mean, I think I, I said a little bit of this, of this before, but the one thing was just meeting other women like yourself and just other people who share your vision and them supporting you along the way um, was just a re was just a reward. I mean, I, I said, you know, I got to work with Makia and and we got to support each other in a way that was just like so awesome. Um, you know, Black Lives Matter DC came out in my race and like you know supported me just in a big way. Um, it was just like amazing because, and oh, you said end on a high note, but I want to speak on the, the notion that being a black woman on the left is really hard and difficult because there's a generational divide in, 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 in black and brown families where our parents' generation are operating from a place of fear. Um, and, and rightfully so. I want to, I want to, sorry, I'm posing it on a high note, but I want people to understand this, that meeting people in your you know who share this is that like our parents generation right now you have to remember that after the assassinations of Megger Evans, Fred Hampton, Harry and um, you know Harry and Harriet Moore, Malcolm X and MLK, our parents generation just dealt with all of our leaders getting assassinated, murdered, like you know, so when they hear the words working families party or DSA, our parents are like, no, please don't go that way. Please don't. They want you to be moderate. But that's because they're coming from a place of fear. And so they were scared straight, essentially. And that straight was really conceding to capitalism, right? And once they conceded to capitalism, you know, those of our parents' generation who didn't concede um, to capitalism were deemed radical and crazy. And we were told as kids to stay away from them. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't, don't be joining them. You don't, go, you know, stay away from them. They're radical and they're crazy. And so when we stepped out, people started to frame us in the same way. She's radical. She's crazy. And I was scared of being framed as radical and crazy until I met other women who were okay with being radical, with being deemed crazy, with being deemed angry Black woman. Um, and so what came out of this space is, a, an ability to no longer be lonely. I don't feel lonely in this mission. I don't feel lonely any longer in this goal. And sometimes when, when you know, and it's gonna be your parents' generation, black and brown women who look like you, some who you admired growing up. You thought they were like great leaders and then you realized they too had conceded. Um, and so it's so important and I'm thankful that every time I get to do panels like this, I meet other women who are okay with being radical, okay being extreme. Uh, Tamika Mallory said, you know, they said, what do you call when they say you're an angry black woman she said yep I'm, I'm the angriest black woman right and so you know it what came out of this is is this the ability to be in alignment with other people women of color people of color who are unafraid to be all of those things um and and that and that for me was the biggest reward um i'm no long no no longer lonely in in this mission in this purpose and in this leadership role Girl, you done took us to church. Child, I'm trying to do a two step and a shout up on this thing. Whew. To add to that, for me, I felt a sense of liberation because I think Janice and I bring this, the progressive Black woman energy and the way that people, they want to put us as a monolith, like traditional Black women on politics do this. Like we shouldn't be radical because we got braids. Like that is not radical. That's culture, right? Um, the fact that I came on was like, girl, take us to church with all of this, right? That's culture, you know? And I think for me, the most liberating thing I have experienced was running um, my campaign as my authentic self. Like all of who I am, even when they tried to polish it up, I was pushing back like, listen, what well, we ain't gonna do. I ain't get right now. That's too much, right? Um, and bringing a different energy into politics because we shouldn't have to 
disregard our culture and the beauty of who we are, you know, you know all, all of that into this because that's what makes us real and relatable. And I think the most inspirational thing that I hit on the front lines, you know, I, I'm gonna give my kids ages. So I have my 30 year old, I have a 21 year old, I have a 16 year old, I have a 12 year old and I have an adopted 21 year old is non gender conforming, right? So I'm experienced all across the board here, right? And having their friends saying I never had the desire to vote because I told them in this campaign, this is if I don't, if I win, it's proof that every voice, every vote counts. And if it, if I win, it proves that you could run and be who you are without conforming to whiteness and still represent your community. And so I was on the subway, since so once I won, I still wrote, I ride the subway. I was on the subway going to City Hall and they was like, yo, Miss Kendra, this, you had it, this is real, like you really won. I'm gonna make sure all my friends is registered to vote and we gonna make this happen because Trump getting out the White House. That was so inspirational. Like in all of that, I was like, yes, girl, you know, that is what's gonna change what we see going forward. We have to learn how to activate all, all of what it takes to be a black woman. And they can't put us in a box. And that's the problem. We have allowed generational have allowed us to put us in this block. We become good, nice black ladies with straighten our hair, right? And tighten up our clothes and wear a good, good girdle and look nice in front of the white folks, right? The next generation is breaking all of that down and I'm so excited to be a part of it. I'm, surprised, I'm so happy to have women like Tiffany and Janice and some other folks with us to kind of lead the way, to change that narrative. So that, that's what the liberation and just the inspiration for the next generation. And I know we got to end, so I just 20 seconds. I, I'm just going to piggyback on what you said in terms of like how liberating and, and amazing it felt to run all unapologetically as I was, to be out front and center as a queer Latina from a, a low-income community and be like, this is who I am and have um, community built around that. You know, Barbara Smith coined the term identity politics and it's it's been sort of, distorted into something else, but like that is important, understanding, um, you know, inequalities and inequities as structural and intersectional that uh, affects particularly marginalized and oppressed people. And that comes along with who we are and, and how we grow up. And so it was really beautiful to build community around that and be accepted and, and bring in more people like me. And then the other thing really that was inspirational was like, I talked about being the, the lawyer in the courtroom screaming into the void and we weren't screaming into the void anymore. We disrupted, we shook establishments, our message reverberated across the country. Like there are clear lines of, of, of to see what we have built and how it keeps on building. And that has been the most inspirational thing for me and it certainly keeps me going. Well, thank y'all so much for taking the time this morning to take us to church to talk to us about what it was like uh, and what your lives are like now. Um, I, I know, I mean, I'm just looking at the chat and I, I'm having people say that like, you know, you've inspired them and, and just hearing about your experiences have like really affected people um, in like a, a really deep way. But also I think like even just knowing some of the nuts and bolts about what it's like to run, I think is valuable to anyone. Um, we have some questions here, but I don't think we have time for them. So we'll just, we'll ask those offline. We'll get more answers later and hopefully we'll have a chance to come together again. But thank you all again for coming out. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you everyone. And y'all know, y'all all have our support always. So <laughs> <laughs> whatever you need, we're here in the future. <laughs> Kendra, go enjoy your vacation. Yes, yeah. please. Yeah. Please have a vacation. <laughs> all right. All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah.